Billy Duncan is a popular performance poet and author of four poetry books, including Beneath the Desk, which was acquired by Brown University for the inclusion in the Harris Collection of American Poems and Plays, and Requiem for the Plastic Clown, which won the Weasel Press chapbook competition. Billy Duncan is also a journalist, a photographer, and artist, and her poems, articles, columns, photography, and artwork have been published in numerous journals, anthologies, magazines, and newspapers. Please welcome Billy Duncan. My name is Billy Duncan, but my friends just call me the fabulous Billy Duncan, and you may call me Fab. All right, I'm going to do some poetry for you. Uh, this first one is from my uh, book, Pages of People, which was the first electronic book ever sold at Barnes & Noble. Yeah, made history. And this is The Fall of Davis Manning. The madness of the leaves when dying is allowed appalled me. The rashness of the sky spread out a drunken whore in graying stupor gave insidious clues of leaves that were to die, of seasons yet to come. The decaying sun sank in sallow yellow at the edge of the greening cloud. Stay still, he screamed at time. I feel like a duck plummeting from sight, from flight, into the jaws of the black pointing setter. I do not welcome winter. I am a lover of the spring. I am a bringer of the crown. I am a man. I have not yet spent the nickels that closed my father's eyes. Fist clenched against the dusky glass, he tattooed violence with his cries. Outside, in the cobwebbed dusk, trees disrobed without a sigh. The rodent wind came screeching in to nibble at the brittle sky, obscenely bearing branches, clawed, departing light. That was the first poem. <laughs> uh, this, uh, this next poem was published in Texas Poetry Calendar. And uh, I have posited that you aren't a true Texas poet unless you have had at least one poem in Texas Poetry Calendar. It's part of the uh, Texas Trifecta, Poetry Trifecta. And this is titled, Nobody, Jesus, the Frogs, and Me. That pretty much sums it up, so I might not even have to read the poem, but I will anyway, here we go. Stuck in the middle of nobodies, like images of the presidents of the United States, who don't look a thing like themselves anymore, stuffed and wrinkled in the pockets of catfish fishermen, crawdad detectors, swamped in a city sinking, line dancing with a troop of extinguished tree frogs across an eternity of pond scum led by a gyrating amphibious Jesus. Jesus, I feel as if I'm about to croak. Bogged down by cold blood while whirling divas hop to it, and the moon splintering on an ancient bayou sends disco lights across the Spanish moss. Public frogs bow down to the quiet white northern goddess of Amherst, giving out calling cards that all bear the name of Nobody. Then kneel down to sip cold beer from a holy vessel while Dickinson lifts the call from her face as she gives birth to herself over and over again. Aristophanes winces as the bayou birds swoop down to feast upon the frogs, leaving me with just a garland of duckweed, an alligator bag, an empty bed, and an unfinished prayer. Here we go, another one. This is so strange without live audience. <laughs> but it's interesting, it's interesting. Uh, and this year, uh, unfortunately, so many things have been canceled. Houston Poetry Fest, with which I've been associated for many years, uh, has canceled. Uh, the uh, Austin International Poetry Festival uh, was canceled, but the anthology has come out. And uh, since the, this is one of the trifecta 
a Texas trifecta. I have a poem this year in the anthology. <laughs> and uh, this is uh, entitled Hours Poetica, um, H-O-U-R-S. It's a, it's a pun on Ars Poetica, A-R-S Poetica, which is poetry about poetry. I had some fun with the title and I hope you did too. Simple, simple, keep it simple. Don't be convoluted or obtuse. Let syllables keep their distance with all the proper spacing. No one really wants to hear the, un the insane sound of a heart that's splitting like a cracking ice sheet screaming that Antarctica is dying. Or the quiet whisper of a sheet across the last face of your last line. Or the distant echo of the nightmare that laughs at your insistence that it is not real. Poetry must be tamed, civilized, incarcerated, blended into a dr breakfast drink that keeps you on your diet. Simple, simple, keep it simple until the words inside your chest cannot be contained and leave your captive heart to burst until they shock you when they write themselves in dark red ink telling you your tongue is still alive. <laughs> and I have lost my, my clock, so I don't know where I am in time, but uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'll be, uh, I'm pretty sure I'll be uh, within the time limit. This is uh, from my book, Breath and Ashes, which was uh, uh, my master's thesis manuscript. And it's called Brenda the Regular, and I thought it was about time that we got a little serious now, okay. The moon is full and so is my bladder. I could get higher, but I'd need a ladder. You know, I think there's nothing sadder than a lonely lass with a bar stool ass and an empty glass when the bartender's turned his head. I'd take a risk if I had a chance for an even shot at a passing romance. But anyone can see, at just a glance, I'm in need of lube with aging tubes, paid for boobs, and a future that's already red. I took a chance on a blues guitar, thought it would soar, but it didn't go far. I just dumped me here at the side of the bar with an empty drink, a drunkard's wink, and a life that stinks. So I guess I'll head off to bed again, alone, <laughs> again, damn. <laughs> uh, this is my last one. Are we, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. There's a multitude of silent applause. <laughs> that, Charlie Chaplin liked that. Yeah, okay, here we go. This is uh, from, uh, uh, also, this has been published in two, two uh, well, it's been published three times. It's uh, called, it's Emmett Faulkner, and it's from the uh, uh, virus vignettes uh, section of Pages of People, and it, it, poems about people that I lost uh, in the AIDS epidemic, and this is Emmett Faulkner. Near the end, he'd rise from the bed, link bone upon bone like an old chandelier, lifted from the floor, almost tinkling as his long translucent fingers dangled from fragile arms. When he stood, I could see light surrounding, an astounding incandescence. He moved. I knew he would shatter if he fell. His crystal splinters would glitter the rug, no broom strong enough to erase them. My fingers ached to flip some cosmic switch, turn him from light to sound, let his actor's voice take flight again, bellow all the words that Shakespeare wrote, sonnets and soliloquies, brilliance and absurdities, passions and odd lines in response to inanities. After he exited, stage left. Amid the argument his mother had with the EMTs, mistakenly called at the very end by a confused friend. I sent his picture to time, where he became a face of AIDS, a place in history, 
in that breakthrough issue. Just his face, and a small mention, a sense of humanity in what had been a dirty secret. When I see young black faces speak the lines of the bard, I hear Emmett, flamboyant white man that who he was, in their tones. Students embraced a dead English poet with such passion because of a teacher's love. I wish them innocence for a while. I wish them days without tears. I wish them bouquets on opening night and light beneath the chandeliers. Thank you. Thank you, Billy Duncan. Wow. Next up, um, we have Eric Brown. He is a recipient of the Imprint C. Glenn Camber Fellowship and is pursuing an MFA at the University of Houston. Eric currently serves as the digital editor for Gulf Coast, a journal of literature and fine arts. Please welcome Eric Brown. Hi, everyone. Thank you um, again, Fran, and the people with Public Poetry and uh, the Houston Public Library. Um, feels really good to be here. Um, and I suppose I'm gonna just kind of jump right in um, since I don't have too much time. Um, the first poem that I'm going to read is an ekphrastic poem and it borrows a line uh, from the film In a Year with 13 Moons. Um, and if you don't know, um, the film is about Elvira, a trans woman, and in the scene that I'm responding to, Elvira um, walks with her friend through a slaughterhouse um, while Elvira sort of soliloquizes. Um, I won't be too explainy, but you can actually find the film on uh, YouTube, I think, still, um, and I think maybe some other uh, streaming services. Um, all right, I'll just jump in. Blood. All these valleys of a body that run hot or cold. Blood is what gives an animal's life meaning. Men whittle fissures into the dam. My body, a blue ghost demands the valleys fill with meaning, that the yard filled with palms open up. The body demands that the knife be a reminder. We will live in a time when the dead will always be beautiful. We have never said anything clearly and my tongue meets the knife like a bull's, because who believes in inconvenience? A blue choked like the Pacific by fog, the body without organs. Show me a city of men. Who can tell that Robert Duncan was wrong? Such is the sickness of many a good thing. The good is sick only in that there is no good yearning to be taken again. The body is a book in which for some only other people write. Like a guest book at a funeral, this literature demands a canon where the knife pens a chronic condolence but who steals the pages outright? I have never said anything clearly, but sometimes there are approximations. The slaughter of a bull that finally stuns high by its ankles to accept a blade blinks. I had to watch to know what it was I'd done while men were over me. Queer poem. 
Also, I apologize if my internet is kind of going in and out. Hopefully that's not the case. Queer poem. Is a queer poem a burglary of joy on the page? Joy has to come from somewhere, something. Is a queer poem a melodrama, a kind of language? Is it camp and apolitical in its revolt, anarchic and thin? Is it sex or autoerotic or does it deconstruct? Does it ring to the tune of compulsory heter heterosexuality? Does a queer poem fail where others erupt? A queer poem knows there is no promised gravity. Is a queer poem just a day when I can't get out of bed? Is it an invisible gesture to a lover, a blank marquee? Is it a list of all my Truvada dreams about nuclear warheads? Is it where the dead are doing wonderfully? Tragedy is impossible in a queer poem after all. Like death, is it erotic or theoretical? A transdermal narcotic? A formal application of the constant move towards a default? Uh, this next poem uh, is after Reginald Shepard's poem of the same name. Reasons for Living. It's the summer before becoming ourselves. The final fire turning sand to glass. No one photographed. Every Pacific sunset is one, and yet all of them Photos are a scam like people who offer up a moment like the tenderness of a eucalyptus, frail and flammable and displaced. There is no old growth, no clean rain, nobody, just the stone that was given to us, that forever thing that evades us every single day, except for that day and we live for that day like a white pine does for no one. Dark and quiet, one grew through my belly, paralyzed and not myself. Was I a tree? Was that the reason? A tree might be a reason, its silhouette even. Thank you. Leela, your sound is not on. Hi. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Let's just try that again. Um, thank you, Eric. And next up, I'd, I'd like to welcome Saba Zahid Hussein. She is an, a Pakistani American poet whose work has appeared in Barrow Street, Bellevue Review, Cimarron Review, the Texas Review, the Dallas Review, and other reviews elsewhere. Uh, and she also has a poem coming up in the forthcoming uh, Lamar University Literary Press Anthology and Sequestrum. She received the 2014 Lorene Pouncey Award at the Houston Poetry Fest. She was a finalist for New Letters Poetry Prize and a semi-finalist for the 2020 Gulf Coast Journal Poetry Competition. Saba holds a BA in Creative Writing from the University of Houston. Please welcome Saba Hussein. Thank you, Leela. I'm going to read five um, short poems, and uh, they are all revolve up around displacement, immigration, and uh, refugee. One of them is about a refugee a woman who actually. Mm -hmm. We're going to start with this poem called The Resettlement. 
We pick zinnias the day before leaving and armfuls of marigolds from a farm refugees had sown. Late September warmed the beans on the poles and somewhere between the kale's meat rows and tomorrow, childhood homes were left behind. We worked fast under the sun, learned where to nip the blooms, arranged petals in blue glass jars, threaded needles through fleshy stems for garlands. We clung to a music of our own, traced henna on our palms, basked in bouquets. No one said goodbye. The other immigrants. So this poem is, um, is about um, Grand Central Station, being in Grand Central Station, or imagining yourself uh, in there. The other immigrants. As if the light from a zodiac spilling onto rose floors and a clock chiming on a waltzing concourse were not enough. How many have stood in the whispering gallery and stuttered into silence when they heard words from its walls and were transported to childhood, counting to 10, playing under lemon trees, anticipating more afternoons, roamed the red brick streets, forts, lush gardens, Lahore, and held on to its ditches and lanes till they found themselves standing under a dome in Grand Central, whispering. Pink magnolia and flowering pear. In the neighborhood by a great lake, luscious trees brim with flowers, full blown like overwhelmed hearts. Such green on lawns can burn a hole through the eye if held for too long. A bike ride away, a gritty bridge where a new settled refugee puzzles over an answer to put down on a form. What do you do for fun? The path overlooking the lakefront homes winds on an inclines for careless strolls. Sunlight glitters on patinaed bunnies and birds and cast bronze boys and girls in a tug of rope in yards of pink magnolia and flowering pear. Blossoms borne by the wind shudder on their journey to water's edge. This next poem is about the refugee mom who passed away. Um, it's a little brutal. Ya Allah, Ya Rab. June bugs are performing rituals of birth and death. It is not June, nor has the clock sprung the hour, but counts each long drawn breath of a mother battling a cancer that marinated in her breasts, then skewered her lungs before staking out her head. She utters what fragments of prayer she can, and she'd curse if she had the strength for the lost cause of a homeland raised by war a worthless spouse who died on her, her children at the mercy of foster care, and this new country whose earth she will become, yet fails to grasp its cold, cold tongue. And June bugs scratching at the kitchen door, spinning on their backs like crazies, gone too long under the heat of a light bulb. Mm by the garden gate. A dried pomegranate rolled out from the trunk as I reached for a bag of groceries. I thought I'd removed it with the others, gifts of a woman who could only give. Plucked a few days before she died last summer. It was hollow now and rattled when I shook it. I placed it on the ledge of the fence to admire its imperfect form faded colors, but it reminded me of a cheek sunken into bone. Later in the day, I searched everywhere, but could not find the dried up thing. It had been buried under the wet soil by exuberant boys who did not know better, but wanted to dig with a garden shovel to see if the seeds would grow. Thank you.
Thank you, Sava. Next, I'd like to welcome Bradley Earl Hogue. He is a Houston expat. His poetry appears in numerous anthologies and journals, most recently in Shanti Arts, Event Horizon, The Transnational, and Split Rock Review. His book, Nebular Hypothesis, was published by Caw and Crow Press in 2016, and his second manuscript, Forest for the Trees, is currently making the rounds. Keep an eye out for that. Uh, he also has four chat books published and was managing editor for Dark Matter Journal. He's been a teacher, a children's museum curator, a college professor, and a vagabond. He's currently secluded in California with his wife and daughter. Please welcome Bradley Earl Hogue. Thank you. I'm glad to be a part of this, um, and hopefully I'll get back to Houston uh, soon. Uh, all of the poems I'm going to read today are uh, uh, from that uh, wandering manuscript that is currently making the rounds. It's a manuscript that weaves observations I've had about climate change with my experience with my son's mental illness. Uh, the first set of poems will be centered around climate change and the second round I'll, I'll focus on the poems about my son. Uh, so the first one is Camp Fire. Smoke outside the window is darkening the room. The way thunderstorms turn daylight into evening. I miss the rain, the steady downpour, the thunder informing me of the state of nature as I peered from inside, protected from the elements. I used to enjoy watching lightning striking the horizon as a child, safe behind sliding glass door. But my quaint misinterpretation of this darkening is exposed by the dread of reality Things are never going back to the way they were. And not just because I'm getting older, but because the negligence of my generation is rendering the capacity of nature to remind us of its glory through ostentatious display, recognizable to human eye, ineffective. Now needing to grab us by the throat in hope of waking us from our delusions in time to make a difference. Uh, the second one uh, sort of follows uh, the same time frame, uh, pretty much the same. Uh, it was it was the you know smoke that reached where I am in California from the campfire. This one's called "Cruelty of a Sunrise." Smoke from the fires that destroyed paradise turned sunrise and sunset into spectacular displays of color, both ends of day equally enhanced. It doesn't matter how many lives lost, how many acres destroyed. It doesn't matter cause or scale, the role of climate change, or even whether you believe climate change is real. The fire once sparked grows indifferent to human suffering, emblazing our recalcitrance and culpability. How else should we see such beauty of sunrise, safely evident from a distance, but as cruel and callous, replacing awe with portent. All right, my third one is also about uh, being out here in California. It's uh, an area uh, in San Francisco itself called Twin Peaks. And the mountain that, that I'm talking about is actually constructed or made of a, a chert, uh, a red ribbon chert. So that's the title of this poem. It's a frequent experience of mine, of being in a place where tourists and locals stare at the beauty of a natural landscape, while I examine the rock's texture at our feet, or exposed like tapestry on outcrop backdrop. Fog rolling in under sunset lit sky in one direction, San Francisco in the other, lighting up for the night, Market Street, the ribbon of red running into the heart of the city. Red chert of Twin Peaks testifying to the ephemeral, ephemeral nature of it all. An ocean shattered and crumpled into hills like paper wads collecting in a trash bin. The experience of a moment held up by reminder that cataclysms frequent Earth's history 
And as I look up, I see the people huddling together for warmth on this windy cold peak here to see the ephemeral beauty of sunset. It seems ironic to me that the first cataclysm wrought solely by human impact is as evident in our world today as in the rocks we stand upon, yet just as easily ignored. And then uh, this, this poem um, is <laughs> actually talking about my, uh, my uh, leaving Houston for California. Uh, it's called Heat. I abhor heat, sweating in insects. It makes me anxious, like needing to burst from my skin, balloon expanding inside me as if bursting would provide relief. If only I could release the pressure. Instead, I seek colder climes, northern latitudes, higher altitudes. And as my life wears on, my journeys take me farther and higher to find the same sucker. Heat expanding behind me to record levels, expanding range of drought and wildfire, snows melting faster, storms growing stronger, winds pushing me away from all that is familiar. And my last one will uh, shift things a little bit away from climate change, um, but still about environmental impacts. It's called The View from Cabo. I'm looking out over the expanse of blue ocean, listening to waves thundering against shoreline, smaller waves farther out, sparkling, pristine, marine seascape, like quartz crystal chandelier catching the light just right. From the balcony of my private beach resort in Cabo San Lucas. Idyllic because I cannot see far enough over horizon to glimpse the garbage patch. Flotsam collecting in gyre current, rivers of plastic flowing into the ocean from coastline, from Alaska to the end of the earth. Brine and sun degrading debris into flocks mimicking phytoplankton filling bellies of fish and birds, mistaking the buoyant pieces for food. Starving chicks just far enough out of sight to justify one more round of drinks before it's time to call it a night. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome back the fabulous Billy Duncan. Oh. Unmute. Hi, I, I did it this time before you said anything. I beat you. I beat you. <sighs> How often does that happen? <laughs> well, all the time in my mind. <sighs> okay, um, I'm going to start off with a poem that's been published uh, a few times. Um, and the second time it was published was actually <laughs> in uh, Houston Poetry. Uh, Fest anthology before I actually became part of the, the what working people in the, in the festival, whatever we're called. Um, so that would mean that that was my first poem in the trifecta, but now since it was the last one I'm reading from the trifecta, it just shows that I actually completed the Texas trifecta. <sighs> Poetry trifecta. Anyway. And this is a twist with that, please. I bathed in a pool of clown tears, washing away my foregone conclusions. <laughs> Tell myself off with your dry wit and prepare to sit on the seat of contention. There is no diet for weighty thoughts. There is no cure for the ham in me. So I ask, if your words were bombs, do you think I could defuse them? You turn from me like a carousel. I know my pretzel words annoy you. Why do you think I use them? <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm going to uh, do uh, a poem from uh, Requiem for the Plastic Clown, whose publication got put off for several different 
reasons for quite a while, but it is actually coming out next month. Yay! Finally! Uh, someone would have had to do a requiem for me by the time the book came out if this had lasted any longer. And this is uh, a poem that has gotten a lot of attention and it's called uh, Cotton Candy. There's something elegantly hidden in the scribbles of the clown. Perhaps the white page is makeup and beneath the printed words, there is another face, a different story. Most children laugh at his silly hair, ridiculous shoes, incessantly honking horn. <laughs> Others cringe in fear. Fear like drowning in a dream or hearing foggy footfalls. It is all pretense, he says. All theater, all application of nonsense. No real harm. But when you creep to the edge of the muddy field, Pull up the hem of the tent near the creaking stake. Peek inside his dressing room. You see him disrobe. Towel off his face and see, see another clown. His diary lies on the table, should you risk your life? Try to find his other layers in the words he wrote in solitude? Or should you play it safe? and take the coins your grandpa gave you. Buy one more cotton candy, a massive pink pile, bigger than your head, that dissipates to die in sticky threads against your warm and silent tongue. <laughs> Thank you, friend. And this one, I'll dedicate this to Fran. <laughs> Just to annoy her. Okay. <laughs> this is from uh, Breath and Ashes, and uh, the poem is Waiting to Speak. You turned our lives into a Van Gogh argument. Bold strokes, turbulent colors, nothing entirely clear. Now that your peculiar portrait of us is through, could I please have your ear? <laughs> oh, I amuse myself so much. <laughs> Sometimes I'm oh, just too clever for my own, uh, some word, <laughs> some perfect word. <laughs> so, um, and hang on, this was not, this was not the uh, the poem I was going to do, so I'm going to have to do something else very quickly. Figure out because apparently I didn't. I did not. Um, oh, we have children in the audience, so I can't do that one. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, sorry, I had this all planned out, but uh, somehow or another, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to do my darling Barry, which could be which is can be spoken or it can be sung, but I'm not going to sing it. I'm just going to pretend it's actual real poetry. And this was also in beneath the desk. My darling Barry. And this was dedicated to someone named Barry. <laughs> Who knows? Riding across the white, bone-bleached prairie, thinking about the last time I saw my darling Barry. In the Porta Cantina, the day Big Rose came by, slugged down 16 whiskeys and stepped up to Barry's side. I walked through the door, that's how it always goes, to find Barry dancing slow in the arms of Big Rose. The piano pale air stopped. I saw fear in Barry's eyes. I said, move apart. One of you's gonna die. Big Rose reached for her pistol. I grabbed my gun to kill. And when our gun smoke cleared away, Barry was lying still. Rose had shattered a hitching post through the swinging door and I'd miss Rose and hit my love lying dying on the floor. He sighed, 
my mama told me true when she sat me on her knee and said that drinking women would be the death of me. I stood there stunned and silent, trying to get a grip, shocked that he had died with such a cliche on his lips. <laughs> Rose put that, her arm around me and she said, it's just God's plan. At least we met each other, though we both lost our man. <laughs> then Rose put down her bottle and I put down my gun and the last time that town saw us, we were riding into the sun. <laughs> Oh, 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 my darling Barry. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that was a sub. Uh, I wrote a series of a cowboy mm -hmm. poets, poet poetry, and uh, so that was one of them. Obviously, I'm just going to do a couple more here, and I just want to say thank you to Public Poetry, thank you to Fran Sanders, my dear friend. Thank you to Leela, you just did a wonderful job. And Brad, it's so good to actually see you again. Want to mention that Brad Hogue in Dark Matter published a poem of mine called My Neighbor's Cat, which was about living next door to Schrodinger. So <laughs> I do appreciate you did that, Brad. Okay, and uh, this will be, actually, I'm just going to do this as my last poem, I think. Yes, this is my last poem that I'm going to do, and I just enjoyed the heck out of this very much. And thank you once again to uh, the Houston Public Library also. Thank you for all your support that you do for poets and poetry and literature in this city. It's fantastic, really appreciate it. This is uh, Ginsburg's Daughter. Teenaged, pretentious, alone in New York City, I decided to have Ginsburg's baby. His genius linked with mine, divine. His gayness did not deter me, his stature a pebble in my path. I would find him, explain, dazzle. He could not resist. He would melt beneath my kiss. I would be transformed by the transfer of his seed. One time, one child, ah, and what a child she would be, precocious, full of angst and nonconformity. Battalions of poets would stand in awe of me, non-Virgin Mary, mother of the unexpected progeny. <laughs> then opportunity hit like a wrecking ball. The father of my unconceived offspring was to lead a march against the slumlords. Sweet destiny. On that fateful day, I stood on the street, my feet touching the same concrete as the mighty Ginsburg. Dozens swarm around him like a swarm of baby squid, each trying with tiny desperate tentacles to latch onto his greatness. I stood on the edge of the maelstrom until a sudden clear path opened, a swatch of calm in that pre-March madness. Were there trumpets blowing in heaven as I walked the eternity of those few short feet? My hand was in the hand that had penned Howl as he looked at me with genuinely smiling eyes. My heart suddenly misplaced, sat down with leaden firmness on my tongue, beating with booming thunder throughout my neck and head. His easy words put the spring back in my voice, something I said made him laugh. <gasps> Extraordinary, that laugh. I had his attention. Next time, something to mention as I led up to my grand plan. <laughs> I never saw him yeah. again. I fed my only living daughter reality sandwiches, brushed her hair in an empty mirror, handed her Kerouac and Ferlinghetti, and sent her on the road. Her childhood passion for words roiled in her mind, turned into junkies, vandals, philosophers, travelers of every kind. The music of her guitar became a highway of lost souls. She told their stories with purity, painted them with poetry, and set them free. On the streets of Avignon, the avenues of Barcelona, the bars of Amsterdam, dancing to the heat of inspiration, the beat 
of an exploding universe. I look in her eyes, see a woman, a visionary, a friend, living art without compromise. I see I did indeed give birth to Ginsburg's daughter. <laughs> All right, that is. Thank you so much. Yes, Thank you. Bravo. Yeah. Wonderful. <clears throat> Next up, we'll come back to Eric Brown. Oh, yeah, I don't need to see him again. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, I think maybe I've had enough of this. <laughs> you then want to come back? Oh. You're gonna, yeah. Open oh, mic. That? Open mic. I'm oh, sorry. I'm, I'm trying to pick up on what. Could people mute themselves, maybe? Um, yeah, um, it's great hearing everybody read. And mm -hmm. I'm really humbled to be reading with, with Billy and, and Saba and, and Bradley. Um, and, uh, and yeah, thanks again to, to Public Poetry um, and the, the Houston Public Library. Um, this next poem, uh, well, I've been writing a lot of poems just come, you know, thinking about memory uh, lately, just with coronavirus and being kind of trapped at home a lot. Um, so for some reason that just brings up a lot of like thinking about the past. Um, and uh, this poem is called Play Dead. I remember the backyard, denim stained green, the way guns signify play. I perform a drop to the ground and die in the front yard. I wake to red pines and a crab apple tree. Have you ever had a wet dream so wet that you had to slither your way to consciousness? The grass is just a mimicry of turf on the floor of a bunker. I remember the letters hidden in the junkyard. I remember the jockstrap that came with sparring. I remember the nights sleeping on another boy's floor. I like to think none of this means anything. What superpower? Is it to see through the silence that collects around men? The silent gunfire we negotiated in yards, silent as in without language. Want is sometimes joined by a conditional if you want. Is that what it is? What that is? Just want? Vanta in Old Norse means to lack which means want is the parent of absence. And if I wanted to know a boy, it meant he was gone. I have walked by the yards of many strangers. I consider the bitter crabapple tree. I keep playing dead. This next poem is inspired by Ira Sachs' uh, short film called Last Address. Um, and you might, uh, if you look it up on YouTube, um, it's, I think it's there in its entirety. Um, so I'm not gonna explain it too much. Um, and this poem also ev is evidence that I have a really hard time titling poems. Um, and this one's called Google Street View Poem. You write to me that as mis Midwesterners, we should be expected to find flourishes like two romantic beavers building a dam as unbearably saccharine. This was taken from a note written by Felix Gonzalez Torres just before he died of AIDS. I sent a quote to you in a letter for your research. You posted a self-portrait of your laundry and bookshelf. 
I found your old address on Google Street View and imagined you climbing down the stairs with your bicycle. I wonder if you saw the ivy growing on the gutter, if you ever gave it much thought. The light in the 360 photo is beautiful, and I wonder what day it was. Uh, this poem is in a similar vein to the previous poem where I was kind of using Google Street View as a way to kind of explore memory. And this poem actually is, is meant to be part of a multimedia piece, but um, I'm just gonna read the, uh, the actual, just the poem itself. The poet considers a house now demolished I wonder how sick I can become. Loneliness is a currency and I should charge by the hour. I don't remember anyone's name from that year, but I remember some distillate of persons. I'm doing them a service. Maybe they are all alive somewhere in the sticky suburbs of Dallas. I've often found in the dark, faded scenes of life drawn by squatters on the bedroom walls in glow-in-the-dark ink, phone numbers for doctors inside the cabinets. Sometimes I sweep the roof, I sweep water. I've written so many poems about this place, I could call it a habit. Like all habits, it's hard to say how we got here. There are years that avoid words. Time is a snake moving slow. I don't see it ebb toward the grass on the edge of the yard. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up, let's welcome back Saba Hussein. Oh, I think you're still muted. Okay, I'm back. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Fran, Leela, the Houston Library, and all the participants who uh, registered and logged on today to listen to all of us. Um, so here goes. Getting to dry ground. Sylvia. I thought of you when my daughter broke up with someone she thought she loved. You were singing, parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme, before your father died. Our friends mocked your sentience. Houston is flooded from the rains. My grandson places a kiss on my arm. My granddaughter is nearly one and bounces to an MJ song. Sylvia, you passed away in the measured inches of a newspaper obituary, and I knew nothing of it till someone cut a snippet and mailed it in an envelope. Decades since we slipped notes across the classroom or walked the corridors at recess in our Karachi convent schoolgirl uniforms. Under the shed of a college courtyard, we nibbled on milk fudge four squares for a rupee, and you told me of your father's cancer. Much of what you never shared was held back in your gray-green eyes. The storm in Houston shut down the city. The creeks flowed over capacity. I tie my horses to higher ground. I keep sweet basil at hand in the pantry. Also want to thank uh, Lamar University for accepting this poem and for allowing me to read it today. I'm going to uh, temper these poems with some sweeter poems. This one is a, something I wrote for someone who was getting married. Epithalamium. Under the sky, blue bonnets, grazing cattle, rows of cypress. 
we took the turn hidden from the highway. Fathers clustered boutonniere, mother blushing in chiffon like the bridesmaid. A shuffle of white organza. The sequestered chapel on the hill where the stone pews, congregation of grasses, isle of myth, coral winds, and you wait for the bell to ring. This next poem is called Threshold. In Houston's wildlife sanctuary, baby blue jays eat plump blueberries. The smell of bird is a sticky green you can never erase from memory. Birds love my friend Mona. They build nests in her doorway, returning religiously at beginning of summer. Mona has taken every bird into her care. She lets them wander in her hair and muzzle, nuzzle in her neck. They vie for her attention all the names she's ever given them, all the child in her they bring out. There was Bumble, the duckling that wandered into her garden the same night another child died in custody at the Texas border without a parent nearby. Mona forwarded me a video of the little fluff ball. There was Bumble at her forehead, Bumble on her shoulder, Bumble on the furniture. I said it probably wasn't the smartest thing to get so close to what's wild. But what else can you do when a baby bird shows up at your doorstep? I sent Mona the link to the Texas Wildlife Refuge on I-10. They took in all kinds of critters. What I did not tell her and what every source confirmed. Without its natural mother, Bumble's chances of survival were down zero. My last poem is a poem I really love, which um, I wrote uh, when I was lying down on the grass with my grandchildren. I have two grandchildren, a seven-year-old and a five-year-old. It's a little poem and I'll leave you with. The things we do to leave something of ourselves. The things we do to leave something of ourselves. Plant a tree, lie under the branches, watch the clouds float across the sky. Teach our grandchildren the names of things. The blue of a blanket, long shadows of branches, a bird in the bed, an ant in a shoe, grass in our hair, the sun shining through, and a spinning planet pinned to our backs. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. That's excellent, Saba. Um, let's welcome back our fourth featured poet, Bradley Hogue. Thank you. This one is entitled, Lucky Boy. You look at my son with his blue eyes and blonde hair and you may consider him lucky. What you don't see is his struggle with mental illness. The rage of emotion spewing from amygdala with every perceived slight or injury. You look at my son with his blue eyes, his style and flair, his churlish grin, infectious laugh, the charisma that thwarts all but the most competent therapy. What you don't see is his struggle with hopelessness, suicidal ideations, depression turning dreams into chimera, every attempt at college, every job dashed by anxiety. You look at my son's accoutrements and bleached blonde hair and see a spoiled kid free from obligation, bequeathal of white privilege, inheritance of my serendipity. You do not see how hard he works to look so flawless, so devil may care, that his greatest fear is for facade to crumble, disdain for his affluenza 
ease into pity. Disguise of blue eyes and blonde hair dissolve to lay bare the vulnerability of life lived on razor's edge. Gorgeous. Uh, the second one is actually why I have the background today. You can see Pinodia dancing in the background if, uh, uh, if you want to look for it. This one is called Pinodia Dancing. I tried focusing on the transcendent full moon chasing us off the plateau, craning my neck to keep it over my shoulder as the bus meandered state highways back to Vegas Hotel. I was avoiding thinking about my son not knowing whether he was sleeping under the same moon, his sky full of stars hidden from him during childhood, or confined to his tent on suicide watch, struggling with demons. We were halfway back from our last stop inside the Grand Canyon National Park. It had been a day sublime in its absurdity. The majestic beauty of Earth's past, layers of Earth's history, leaning on the shoulders of the Vishnu schist, like art books on a bookcase. Some tilted against each other on one shelf, some laying flat on others. I saw evidence of three oceans, but only two I can name. The elusive sea floating in the middle ground of my ignorance and wonder. The watercolor haze emulated beneath the vivid bright colors of the layers above. I am no longer the one comforting my son learning technique of therapeutic hold to help calm his rages as a young child, holding him while he struggled with the torrent of emotion flooding his young brain, feeling that rage course through him as he tried to bite and scratch me, as he hurled words at me in an attempt to hurt me, and then to feel it drain away as his mind calmed. And he returned to the sweet child he had been just moments before whatever subtle trigger sparked his rage. I remain trapped between perspectives, living in the limbo of superposition, of fear and dread, of hoping for the best and preparing for the worst without any opportunity for surprise from either outcome. Spoiled by my experiences and opportunities that allow me the privilege of taking a day away from conference to visit one of the most beautiful places in the world. By education that allows me to see the continents dancing through time, from Rodinia to Panodia and Pangea to today. Watching the rages of his early childhood become anxiety and depression during adolescence and eventually diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. It is not yet an hour after leaving the canyon, yet I'm already distracted by my arrogance and ego that threatens to destroy any wisdom I might gain from this experience lacking capacity to help determine my son's fate. My inability to comfort him now that he is a young man, still fighting constantly the same rush of emotion from amygdala that fed his rages as a child. The humility of insignificance in face of such ephemeral grandeur, horror of never knowing the stratigraphy of his moments, the momentary comfort of his embrace. My story with him, my hope, has always involved holding him. All right, my third one is uh, actually the only poem that, that, uh, of this either round that has been published. It was in my novel, uh, Nebular Hypothesis. It's called A Father's Hands. I often write about how ephemeral mountains are. Broken, jagged pieces of earth thrust up like splinters of broken board or bone transient remnants of violence and upheaval ultimately erased by wind and rain and time. But in this moment, flying over the Wasatch Range, suspended in place, time stopped for the moment, I see them as cradles, a father's hands, already weathered by age and destined to become completely ravaged but at this moment, still solid and strong and capable of holding him still, at least in this moment. All right, I've got a couple more. Um, Mount Montana 
uh, or Mount Montara is, is uh, what I see every morning when I walk the dog. So this is entitled Mount Montara. Some days it is obscured in fog, not completely, though sometimes so. Usually a peak pokes through, often both peak and base. The fog wafting past like hands playing peekaboo with a child, moving in front of face. It's gone. Did it ever exist? And then away. There you are. But only briefly. The game played over and over until the fog lifts and the mountain becomes an obstacle to overcome again and again. All right, my last poem is um, about Houston. And hold on, because I didn't get both pages of it. Um, and uh, I would also like to thank, before I read this last poem, of course, thank everybody who has uh, been involved with this, and for particularly Fran, and, and for inviting me back to be a part of, of this reading and to be connected to Houston again in this way is really special. I always enjoy uh, reading with, with Billy and, and Saba and um, Eric. I, I love your poetry. It's wonderful. So thank you again um, for allowing me to be a part of this. And I probably will try to fumble through find the first page of Fighting Buffalo Bayou. All right, here we go. All right, sorry about that. Fighting Buffalo Bayou. Getting too old for this. Taking students in canoes down the bayou, pointing to the ospreys, herons, and spoonbills hiding in the crevices of an urban landscape. You would think the serene bayou would allow time to explain in more than a few words what I meant to say. But the current is stronger than appearances and intentions, and the students are no help. They have no experience with canoes, often paddle the opposite direction from what I ask for. It is often easier to both steer and try to move forward at the same time. But it is harder to consider my words trying to maintain equanimity while exerting strenuous effort. Hard not to lose patience and explode, my own serene facade giving way. The changes in direction, the outbursts of frustration, the impulsive destructive choices, a sort of self-medication against the rage of never being understood, of rush of emotion washing over so quickly that reason has no chance to emerge through the torrent. And so I keep steering, trying to move forward. And there are times when I get caught in eddies requiring all my effort just to stay in one place until I realize, let the current take you backwards far enough to return to waters calm enough to allow moving forward once again. The destination getting closer by inches, providing the hope that I will get there eventually so long as I can maintain my strength and stamina just a little while longer. Thank you.